When I came to this church, it was my intent to find a church that believed in God and adhered to the Bible. I think I remember redoing the, uh, the sanctuary, and that was a big project there. So I don't look at it as just a building or just grounds, but I see it as investment in lives of people. That's why I'm interested in giving toward that direction. I see it as um, an investment in eternity. I have the fortunate blessing to serve on our board, and you know, it's been talked about, you know, almost every month, you know, how's Smith Street property? Because we are bursting at the seams. I help with VBS, and there's kids everywhere. We didn't know where to put them. Um, Wednesday nights, we can't have Bible study here because it's filled with kids, and that's a good thing. I can remember on the outside of the fence, you know, looking in, peering in, as I'm sure many people have done before, but standing with my grandparents and Grandpa Berge, you know, asking, what do you think, Ryan? Should should we, <laughs> should the church purchase the, the land? I mean, it was something that was talked about more than once. He was definitely a dreamer. That was something that really, you know, fascinated him and um, the church physically growing. So when Christian and I met, he originally wasn't coming to KCC. Everything with our relationship, we got to know each other at KCC. I showed him the bell tower because it's like the coolest place in church. We spent like hours up there just talking and playing games and asking questions about each other. And eventually that's where he proposed to me and here we are now. <laughs> I, I believe this is our legacy. I am trusting in the Lord that he's gonna provide and I'm trusting in with him with all my heart. I really think that we need to always move forward. He's grown our church so much beyond like our wildest dreams and now like this is literally next door, a door has opened up. He takes me out of my comfort zone and that's what I need constantly so that I will trust him by faith. When God calls, we want to answer, but prayer has to be a part of that, you know? I listen. I follow. Anywhere. Whatever. When God calls, you answer. Yeah, you answer. There's Emmy, right there. Couldn't get her to smile on camera, but she's smiling now, huh? <laughs> uh, what a legacy we've received as a church, uh, a legacy of faith and faithfulness throughout the generations. And I just love, you know, hearing those testimonies of how much the church has meant to so many generations today and throughout the past. And what a legacy we have, you know, 2000, almost 2,000 years of Christian history leading up to this moment, but also 140 years of KCC, uh, the fir very first church in this city till now. God has been faithful because of the faithfulness of his people seeking to expand and grow his kingdom. And so that's the legacy we've received, and we get that great joy and responsibility to move that forward, and, and this, this mystery of expansion is part of that. It's part of making space, making room for growth. And our, our hearts long to see that we know Kingsburg is growing and we wanna grow along with it. And so come September 29th, that's our opportunity where we get to make a three-year pledge to pay off that building, Lord willing. And so please just be in prayer about that, how God is gonna lead and direct you to be a part of that, whether that's a one-time gift or a monthly gift or a weekly gift and throughout those three years. Be in prayer about that. And what a neat thing to, to see the kingdom expand in this real practical, tangible way right here. And so as we continue this morning our series through the book of James, James is going to give us some wonderful, practical, tangible ways to put our faith into practice. As we open up to James chapter 3 today, we're going to look at what it means to bring everything into alignment with Christ, from the tops of our head to the soles of our feet. And James is going to put a spotlight for us on the most crucial piece of our body, 
that needs to be in alignment with him and with his word. And that little body part is called the tongue. And our tongue needs constant managing. And however it's managed or not managed, the rest of our body, the rest of our spirit, the rest of our life follows that. So to catch everyone up on where we've been in James, it's basically New Testament wisdom literature in line with Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and the Sermon on the Mount from our Lord Jesus. It is very similar to those things. The way it teaches is very practical. It gives us this reflective wisdom and then this practical wisdom to go and do. And that's why I love it. That's why I know so many of you, it's like one of your favorite books. You're like, you're telling me as we're going through this series, like I've always loved James, it's been my favorite. Yeah, because it's so practical, it's to the point. It doesn't mince words, it's like, this is it. Do this, don't do that, tame the tongue. Okay, so as we've been going through James, this is our fifth week now in James. Week one, uh, we studied count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. And Farmer Craig so generously provided a picture of, you know, when we face trials of various kinds. And then I got another picture from Farmer Tyler. He said, this is the same week, actually, as the other picture, but, you know, he decided to send it to me and say, this is what we face on a pretty regular basis, and, well, hopefully not super regular, but, uh, yep, he gets stuck, count it all joy. Uh, the next week, we talked about the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Sometimes our life gets derailed, and anger doesn't help us solve the problem, does it? It doesn't produce righteousness. It doesn't produce a solution, and so, here that, you know. That's what happens sometimes. And uh, we got another, another photo here of week three, don't show partiality. It's just like this bird. Okay, we don't want to show partiality to, to these little chicks here. Uh, next week, or last week, we talked about faith without works is dead, and our faith should have good fruit, tasty and sweet and good fruit that follows from it if indeed our faith is alive. And so like this apple tree, it's like it produces apples because it's an apple tree and it's living. And so there's going to be good works that come from that life that happens there. And, and Farmer Craig sent me this photo of gophers that did some really good work and sunk the wheel of their... <laughs> of his trailer here, and uh, well, and he let the gophers live, didn't you, Craig? That was, he did, he didn't get angry, you let him live, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so this week now, we're going to be studying how loose lips sink ships. James gonna, is going to teach us how to tame the tongue, well, at least how to do our, our very best at attempting to tame the tongue. It's quite hard, isn't it? Uh, James begins in chapter 3, verse 1. We're looking at verses 1 through 12 this morning. He says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Okay, it's strange for me to be reading this while teaching, uh, but it's a sobering reminder that God is watching and he cares for his word. And contextually, that's what he's talking about here, teaching the word of God. James is speaking about those who teach God's word. And he even includes himself in this, doesn't he? He says, he says we who teach. All right, he's the leader of the early church in Jerusalem. And he understands that he indeed is teaching God's word. What he's doing, he understands it to be the word of God. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, it's living, it's breathing, it's active, and it's not something to be taken lightly. For we look at Jesus while on earth doing ministry here, we see repeatedly how careful he was to fulfill the word. Have you not read? Have you not read? He did this to fulfill the word. He did this to fulfill all righteousness. He, he was so careful to follow and keep the word. It's his word, of course. But how much more, seeing Christ, how much more should we take it seriously and follow it? The king of kings followed the word to the letter. So while people teach the word, they must be careful to follow it themselves. And they must be careful to teach it in truth and not in error. For God is watching. He's watching. And not only God, but, well... 
those who are listening to the teaching are watching. So yes, I will be judged on what I teach because God cares about his word. And he cares about it being taught faithfully. And if my life or, or teaching should cause someone else to stumble, well, that's a, a terrible thought. And it's worthy of a stricter judgment because of the position of teacher. So if you aspire to teach the Bible, go into it with both eyes open, knowing that, that this is the seriousness in which we enter into teaching God's word. And you better be sure that God is calling you into teaching it, because as he calls, he will equip. And as he calls, it would be a shame for us not to answer the call of God on our life. And likewise, understand that it's a dangerous thing to reach for it without being called into it, into the position of teaching. Unfortunately, today, there are, so, there are so-called Bible teachers. Many of them, in fact, just as Jesus warned, there would be, there would be many false teachers in the last days, deceiving many Matthew 24, deceiving many. So there, there, there are, unfortunately, many so-called Bible teachers who, you know, some of them fancy themselves, you know, more recently as deconstructionists. You'll hear that term being thrown around. And they, they seek to deconstruct the faith of their listeners in order to refashion their faith and belief after their own image. That's what they're doing. When they deconstruct the faith, they're like, I'm going to deconstruct this old faith and then reconstruct it in my image or in your own image, however you want your faith to look. This is what they do. Uh, there are so-called prophets who seek to proclaim themselves as those who hear from God and they speak God's word. You know, I'm, I'm just telling you what I'm hearing, it says the prophet. And they've had all these false prophecies. You see a lot of them on YouTube and things like that. <laughs> all these false prophecies, they never repent of those. They're like, oh, you know, you just got to use your own discernment. You know, and, and they lead people astray into, into, into terrible things, not understanding. So there, there are false prophets who lead people into heresy, you know, believing in, in this uh, new, there's a new revelation. Or, you know, I received these tablets of gold that were written on, and I got these special glasses to read them. It's like they lead people into heresy, into, into maybe it's works righteousness. You've got to do these things in order to be saved. That's from the pit of hell, isn't it? That's, Jesus came, and he's like, no, no, no. Only through me. It's through me. And, and so, so there's works righteousness, false prophets, and then there's hedonism, false prophets, where it's like, oh, it doesn't really matter what you do. It's all grace. We're all going to the same place. All roads lead to, lead to Rome. All roads lead to heaven. It's all good, man. Don't worry about it. It's like there's those false prophets, too, that are, well, just as dangerous, aren't they? They neither love Jesus nor do they understand his sacrifice on the cross. And then there are so-called pastors who feed off of the sheep rather than feeding the sheep. Now, Jesus says to Peter, if you love me, you will feed my sheep. There are pastors who have sinned out of ministry. And every time that happens, it makes my job more difficult. Okay, and Everybody's looking at me, are you going to do that too, pastor? It's like, well, I need to be on guard, don't I? I need to be on guard. I need accountability in my life. <clears throat> there is stricter judgment on me, not only from God, but from his church as well. Uh, pastors are fired for immoral behavior that if you're in another job, you know, your, your boss wouldn't bat an eye at it. It's like, oh, yeah, well, you cheated on your wife, oh, no big deal. Uh, so did this guy over here, he's still working. It's like, that's how regular places of work operate, but if something, if I do it, something like that, and sin out of ministry, I'm fired. I'm fired, and rightly so. There's a stricter judgment from God in eternity and here and now. And so it's better to receive the judgment here and now, isn't it, to lead you into repentance so that you indeed will be saved and you can turn to God. You, know, you lose your position of ministry, but you, you repent, you turn to God, and you're, you're saved indeed. There's grace, of course. But if you're leading people astray, if you're leading people into heresy and you never repent of that, there are false teachers who will rightly deserve the punishment and the judgment they receive at the end of the age. For they are not serving God, they're serving the devil. <clears throat> Telling someone I'm a pastor gets the most mixed reactions you can imagine. 
you know, sitting on a plane or getting to know somebody. It's like very mixed and strong reactions. You know, either there's like, they're gonna vent all of their frustrations about the church to me. You know, they're, they're gonna ask a lot of questions. Uh, it'll shut down the conversation. Sometimes it's like, oh, okay, this is a weirdo. <laughs> or sometimes it creates this wonderful conversation that happens. Like, oh man, there's so much joy that can come from that. So James is like, not many of you should strive to be teachers. There's a stricter judgment that happens. So my job as the teacher is to allow God's word to speak for itself. I don't think you want Ricky's opinion on all the current events. I don't even want that, okay? I don't want you guys just be telling my opinion on all the current events. I want God's opinion to be known on what he desires from you and from me right now. Right now. What he wants to do in our life and our heart and our family and our community right now. And when we know that, when we know that, then whatever happens in this world, whatever tragedy or comedy of errors that's taking place in the world, we could stand firm and rejoice in any circumstance because we know we belong to the one who overcame the world. Amen? Amen. So we are not self-deceived. We are to be sober-minded, knowing our hope is not in this world, for we are citizens of the kingdom of God, and that is where we belong. We are ambassadors here and now for this short time. So may we live as such. So, so James says, be wary. Be wary of teaching because you'll be judged with greater strictness. Moving on, verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways. Of course, we, we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. So yes, we stumble in many ways. And so again, that's why you should be aware if you're a teacher. Because there's only one who is perfect. <laughs> in all of human history, there's only one. It's our Lord Jesus. He did not stumble in his words. He did not stumble in his actions. He, he was able to bridle his tongue and bridle his whole body in accordance with the will of God, according to the word of God. But may we take note and not like, let this be an excuse. Oh, yeah, we all stumble, so why even try? No. James here, he gives us the key in how not to stumble. It's to bridle the tongue. Because the whole body is going to follow the tongue as it carries our whole self forward or maybe backward or sideways or off kilter because of how we use our words. So, so it comes down. He's simplifying it for us. Very practical. Bridle the tongue. Verse 3, he goes on. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Man, we understand that in California, don't we, with the, the wildfires that have raged in this past decade from a very small spark that started them. The War Advertising Council coined the phrase, loose lips sink ships during World War II. And this phrase was used to inform people to be careful of what they said. And so here is the US, loose lips might sink ships, and then Britain also had their own, careless talk costs lives. And it's true. They understood that. They wanted people to be careful with what they shared, where they were going. And there's a more recent one that the Navy came out with, loose tweets sink fleets. <laughs> so, yeah, you don't want to be tweeting about where you are in the Mediterranean Sea. I mean, it's, so it's true. You need to bridle the tongue. Uh, relationships can be burned down because of what we say. Children can grow up repeating these phrases and these, these tracks in their minds of these lies and, and these curses that maybe friends or classmates spoke over them. Perhaps today, many of you are still battling with, with, with what somebody said to you long ago, oh, you're stupid. 
And you're like holding on to that. Oh, you're lazy. You don't you never do anything good. And, and that track is like repeating in your mind. You're worthless. Nobody likes you. You're annoying. And those words have stuck with us. It's so bad, in fact, that we've had to come up with a phrase. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, we, we came up with that phrase because words really do hurt, don't they? But, but what this phrase is, it's a declaration. More than it being true, because the words hurt, it's a declaration. In order to fight against the lies and the hurtful words, we must declare that they do not have power over us. They do not define us. We declare what God says of us. We are his dearly beloved. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are gifted and chosen to belong. We declare that the words of cursing are powerless before the truth of God. For you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Don't underestimate the power of words, and never underestimate the power of the word of God. It brings to nothing the destructive lies of the ancient enemy of our soul. We've been given here the ministry of reconciliation, the ministry of healing, of speaking truth in love, of building one another up, of praying for one another. And yet our tongue can be and is used for such destructive and, and poisonous things, but it has such potential to bring life and goodness. And in verse 6, James, he begins a bit of a rant about the tongue. I think he's maybe experienced, he's seen some of this happen in the, in the churches, and he, he goes on a rant here, verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. There aren't many sins that don't involve the tongue, you know, speaking in some way. He says, the tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh water and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. And this ends the section. So James here is using analogy after analogy to show how corrupt our tongue is, how, how it must be tamed, but it cannot be, but we must try nonetheless, because it's poison. It, it can be so contrary to the ways of God. And he rightly asks, you know, how can we speak poison and blessing out of the same mouth? It's inconsistent. We must become consistent is the call to, to become an integrated people of faith that bridle our tongues for good, not ill. Training our tongues to be quick to forgive, quick to apologize, quick to, to cover in an offense, quick to, to listen and, and slow to speak, tongues that are consistent with our faith, tongues of the living fire of the Holy Spirit. It's no mistake that James uses the destructive fire, that spark, that fire, that our tongue could set ablaze. He uses that as an analogy, and it's not a mistake, because by so doing, he's reminding us how the Holy Spirit descended upon the early church as tongues of fire that descended over the heads of the people. So James here is, is contrasting the destructive capabilities of the tongue with the people knew those tongues of fire, the power that can be held in the tongue. Jesus told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem. He says, don't go anywhere, wait for the Holy Spirit. You're going to need that. You're going to need those tongues of fire, to set the holy fire to descend upon you from God. You're going to need that power before you go forth. Wait. Wait until you receive that. And when they received it, 
that came in power is set the church on fire, a holy fire. They were, they were able to proclaim powerfully the word of God. The, the tongues of power that came in the Holy Spirit, what did it do? It broke down barriers. People understood each other when the Holy Spirit came, didn't, it? didn't they? <laughs> they understood each other. They were like, we don't speak the same language. We, we understand each other. It brought unity. It broke down these barriers that had come up. And people came to faith in power. That, that is the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us and through us. That is the power that we need to allow to work in our tongue, in our speech. Because the tongues of power proclaim with integrity and consistency the word of God. Tongues of power allow the word of God to transform every part of their life. So they speak fresh water from fresh water. So that the fruit of the message is, is consistent with the fruit of the messenger. So that we go from strength to strength. Because as Proverbs 12, 25 says, For anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. A good word dispels darkness. Proverbs 16, 24 says, And pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. A good word brings sweetness to the soul and health to our bones. Words reach the deepest parts of us, the deepest recesses of our soul and our body to our very bones. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And this brings us to lesson one from the text today. Lesson one, break the tongue like a wild horse. A wild horse has never been directed. A wild horse has never been commanded or told to stay still or turn left, move this way. A wild horse does what feels good in the moment. A wild horse will always chase the hill that the grass looks greener on. A, a wild horse will do what it wills. And because of that, it isn't good for much, is it? It just tramples grass, eats it, and then maybe it gets eaten itself, I suppose. But a horse that is broken and tamed and trained is good for a lot of things, isn't it? It's good for a lot of things. It brings joy to many people. It's loved. It's cared for. It has a roof over its head. It's got good food in its belly. There are even therapy horses, aren't there? They're wonderful. They do wonderful things for people. That, that, that brings healing to people. Their, their, their psyche and their body. It kind of, horses are amazing creatures when they're broken, when they're tamed, when they're trained. Otherwise, they're useless. I think you get the point. A horse isn't broken and tamed and trained by happenstance. It doesn't happen by accident. And neither does it happen all at once. It happens through discipline. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, he says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we, an imperishable. It's like, what we're striving for is imperishable. How much more should we strive for that? So I do not run aimlessly, says Paul. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control. Literally in Greek, Paul says, I pummel my body and make it a slave. That's what he says. He says, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. This is how seriously Paul takes the call of teaching. The Apostle Paul does not want to disqualify himself after preaching the gospel. And if Paul is so concerned with this, well, then how much more should we be concerned with this? How much more must we pummel our bodies into submission to make them a slave of righteousness, to bring goodness and love and mercy and truth and life James identifies the most crucial piece for us to pummel <laughs> in our whole body is this thing. It's the tongue. 
Pummel it. Tame it. Train it. It sets the course of the entire ship. It steers the whole body. What does the captain of a ship do? Where is the captain of the ship? He's always at the steering wheel, isn't he? He's always, you know, checking their heading, you know, either by the stars or, or by the sun back in the day. And he, he's commanding the crew to, you know, do the sails or not. But he's at, he's at the rudder. He, he, he's at the wheel directing the ship. That's where the captain is. That's where he needs to be. The entire craft needs managing but the most important place is at that wheel that steers the whole thing. This is our body, the tongue, it steers the whole thing. This is, this is the church. This is our work. This is our, this is our finances. This is our household. This is our spiritual lives. And it begins with the tongue. And we have a great gift from our Lord, the Holy Spirit. That greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Greater is he who is in us than the wrong thing we want to say. <laughs> than getting the last word in, you know, than than responding in anger. Greater is he who is in us than that desire to do that. This brings us to lesson two and our final takeaway, which is by taming the tongue, you bring your whole life into order. Everything begins to come into alignment. The whole ship follows that small rudder. And so I want to spend the rest of our time this morning talking about stewardship, stewardship. We've got our big campaign coming up, and in this time leading up to it, it's important that we are seeking God through prayer and asking how are we going to steward our lives and what we've been entrusted with to further God's kingdom. You see, from the very beginning, words created us and directed us, and then words deceived us. When we stop listening to God's word and begin believing the lies and do not trust God, then we get out of alignment. So, so we can't manage anything outside of us. We can't manage it well unless, first and foremost, we are managing ourselves. We are in alignment with God. So by taming the tongue, we can bring ourselves into alignment with God's best for us. For as our Lord says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if our mouth is speaking in truth and in love, then our heart is in the right place. And from that, all the rest can easily follow. But it takes managing. It takes stewarding. I know many who wisely avoid the job of manager, uh, managerial positions in their places of work, because in that role, you are responsible for those who report to you. And then you're also responsible to those who are above you. And so there's greater responsibility. You're like, I don't want to deal with that hassle. Okay, Jesus says in Luke 12, 48, he says, everyone to whom much was given of him, much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. So yeah, there is, there is much demanded when there's been much entrusted. In Genesis, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and all over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Then the Lord took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it, to keep it, to manage it. So we've been given dominion over the earth. We've been entrusted with much. We've been given, we've been entrusted with the the gospel of Jesus Christ with the powerful message of the gospel, this life-giving message that cost our Lord Jesus the most precious thing, his very lifeblood. We've been entrusted with that. So, yeah, much has been entrusted to us. Much has been entrusted to us. And, And there is greater responsibility because of that in stewarding all that God has entrusted to us, no matter how small or how great. And just as in this life, good managers get more to manage and poor managers lose what they have, so it is in the next. In the parable of the talents, Jesus commended the good steward who made a good return on what he'd been entrusted with and he condemned the man who who managed his money that he'd been given by burying it. He buried what the master gave him and got no return whatsoever 
uh, he, he had no return for the master when he, when he came back to settle accounts. And so he's been entrusted with riches, and this lazy man neglected it and buried it. He failed the test. The, the wicked and lazy man, as Jesus calls him, said this to the master. He said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. So this is what he declared with his tongue, revealing his heart. He did not love the master. He hid what was entrusted to him to manage. And instead, he did whatever he wanted to do, didn't he, while the master was away. He refused the call to manage, to steward what God entrusted to him, to tame his tongue in accordance with God's word. And unable to do that, he was unable to do anything else profitable. In 32 out of the 35 parables that Jesus taught, he taught about managing, being stewards. Stewarding is defined as one who manages the affairs or assets of another. That's our job here. We're God's little managers. And the test we face is the test of stewardship because all creation is God's. It all belongs to him because he created it. So be good managers. In order to do that, we have to remember who's the owner. We have to remember it's God, it's not ours. He created it, it's his. You know, we think we create, but we only like mix and match things and, and alter them creatively. But God has made all of these things. In fact, he's given us a brain to do those things, to be creative. We're made in his likeness. We can do creative things with it, but ultimately, it's all from him, it's all to him, it all belongs to him. We're temporary stewards of the gifts he's given to us. And like with the parable of the talents, and, and like with any steward or manager, no owner shares everything with his manager. God always holds something back for himself in the, in the area in which we are to earn our living so that we never forget that God is the owner and we are the managers. God gave us six days to labor, and on the seventh, it is to rest and to worship him. God says, keep it holy. It is a Sabbath to God, and it's a gift for us to rest. This is for him. The other six, you work, you do that how you want. This is for him. In Leviticus, we read that the tithe is holy to the Lord. It's holy to the Lord. And from this, we see that there is something deeply spiritual that happens in our giving. You get nine parts, God requires one part. If we hold on to that one part, we're withholding from the owner his due. We are robbing God, as he says, when we neglect the tithe. And of course, you know, God doesn't need our money in any way, but he's the owner, and he doesn't want us to forget that. He's the owner. In, in the garden, God said to Adam and Eve, he said, you can eat from every tree except one. All the rest is yours, but the one, the one. And that one is a reminder of who owns the garden. This is mine. You don't eat of that. All the rest you can eat of. Your manager is in this garden. That one tree is mine. So in, in obeying, we learn the principle that we are the manager and God is the owner. So God always holds back something for himself so that we never forget he is the owner and we are the managers. He doesn't force us. Adam and Eve grabbed the fruit and they ate of it. They're like, we want to be like God. So they took what, what they should not have. They said, we're the owners. We're going to own it. They weren't obedient to what God called them to do. He doesn't force them. He doesn't force us to do this. But he gives us the opportunity in love and obedience and in faithfulness to him to give him his due. From these examples, we see that, that God owns time, the days of the week, the, the, the rotations of the solar system. Like there's six days to work, one day to rest, seven days. God owns all resources and money. God owns all creation. And these are gifts from him to us to manage them. We are like the franchise owners of the Subway and the, the Chick-fil-A. What happens if the Subway and Chick-fil-A don't, don't pay the corporate, you know, leaders their due? 
Well, they lose that store, don't they? But they, they get to keep the vast majority of the profits at the same time. But there is a due that they must pay to those who own it. So it is with God. Because where your time and treasure is, there your heart is. We know that's true. And Jesus says it is true. <laughs> so Jesus wants our heart to come into alignment with him in trust and obedience. And that means, well, according to God, that means one-seventh of our week belongs to him. One-tenth of our finances belong to him. It's not much. But what it does, like, like our tongue, it brings everything into alignment. It's a starting place. You know, Jesus says to the Pharisees, he's like, you, you tithe even from your personal gardens. You're tithing your dill, your mint, your cumin. Like, that's good. Okay, do that. <laughs> but don't neglect the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. Like, do, do both of those things. Do both. The, the, the tithe is like a starting place. It's like, and, and then God desires generosity to spring forth. It's more blessed to give than to receive, as Jesus teaches us. And we could share in the joy of God who, who gives every good and perfect thing. Everything we have is from God. And there's a, it's a joy for him to give. He takes pleasure in giving for his beloved children. So each day is a gift from God. The ability we have to produce is a gift from God. So again, as the body falls in line, when the tongue falls in line, so our lives fall in line, when we steward all we have with in mind that God is the owner of it all. We're accountable to him and we want to live faithfully in what he's called us to do. He gives us very few specific commands and lots of freedom, doesn't he? That's a heart check. It's a heart check for us. If we indeed acknowledge God as Lord, then, well, let's give him lordship in our lives. It begins with the first fruits, going to God with the first day of the week for us, being set aside to him. And you know, when we give, it's, it's, we give to God. There's no strings attached. If the church spends money on something I don't like, I don't give differently to the church. What's that to me? I'm giving to God. When, when, I, when I make my tithe to the church, I'm giving to God. And the church is responsible before God Almighty and how they spend those funds. I'm responsible for my teaching and the preaching of the word. I'm accountable before God for that. It's on me. And so now that I've shared with you the word of God, now it's on you. So yeah. I, did, I did my part. Okay, there you go. <laughs> you go. Do something with it. <laughs> I've been wrestling with this text all week. Okay, it's your turn now. Okay. I don't see what anybody gives here. I don't want to, you know, Pastor Ed set up this tradition. I, it's not, we don't need to. But God, but know that God sees. And it's a wonderful thing. God sees. Remember when Jesus was watching everybody bring their gifts and these very, you know, wealthy people were dumping in huge sums of money and that widow dropped a, a single coin in and he called his disciples. He's like, guys, she put in more than all the rest. She put in everything she had to live on for that week, and she entrusted it to God. And it was a beautiful thing in the sight of Jesus. So he watches, he knows. And, and when we give, we, we give to him. It's, it's a faithfulness thing to him, a love of him. So know that, be encouraged by that. And just like in taming the tongue, it's like, yeah, we, man, we, it takes practice. It's like, we stumble in many ways. It's, but we, we can bring that into greater and greater alignment. We can bring every aspect of our lives, our, our time, our money, what God has entrusted to us, our family, our relationship. We can could, we could bring all of that into greater and greater alignment with God through the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. That's the calling. Jesus owns our heart. Let's declare that with our actions. Uh, the owner of a large grocery store agreed to allow a neighboring church to use the store's parking lot for overflow traffic on Sunday mornings. But the owner of the store said, <clears throat> however, pastor, one Sunday morning a year, you will find a chain across the parking lot. That, he said to the puzzled pastor, is so that the church never forgets 
the parking lot belongs to the grocery store and not the church. So may we never forget who owns our heart, our life, where every breath comes from, who gives us each new day, who owns everything that we have and and has put us as stewards over those things. And it begins with our tongue. It begins with our tongue. But may we take everything he has given to us and turn it around to bring him glory, to expand his kingdom, and to give generously to see that happen. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the joy of belonging to you, for the freedom that brings. Lord, may, may this church continue to declare powerfully with our generosity, with our faithfulness, that Lord Jesus, you own our heart. You are the head of this body, the church, and we follow you. Help us to do so in trust and in obedience, in love and in mercy. Help us to align our whole life from the tops of our head to the soles of our feet, our whole hearts, our our bodies, our spiritual lives, the lives of our family, everything. Help us to align them to follow you, to be about the things you've called us to be about, to be faithful with the little that you've entrusted to us. God, we thank you for that. We thank you for that. Would Would you bring increase to KCC? Increase in depth, in breadth, in our faithfulness, in our walks with you. We love you, Lord. Thank you that you've called us to belong. Thank you that you've forgiven us. You've wiped us clean. You've blotted out our sins as far as the east is from the west, Lord. We praise you and we thank you for that. Help us to walk in that new life that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together.